welcome to another edition of the Sports Hot Seat, and I'm glad to be back. And uh, today, Mitch Melnick, we've got a very special guest, one of the greatest hockey writers of all time, one of the best dressed journalists that either of us have ever known, and the author of a great new hockey book. <laughs> Who's a better hockey writer than you? Can't think of anybody <laughs> right now. So, so one right, of the... Let's go back. <laughs> the, the greatest Here's the book. Writer. This is Red Fisher. You all know Red from the Montreal Gazette. And this is a book. It's about time. It's not called It's About Time, but it's about time Red wrote it. Red Fisher, Hockey Heroes and Me. It is about time. Why did you wait so long to write a book? I didn't need the money. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, I mean, these things take time. I wasn't really, you know, that interested in... And sitting down and writing a book. I mean, I'm working with deadlines uh, day in, day out, week in, week out, year in, year out. Uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, at the beginning of the book, uh, people like Ken Dryden write books, people with lots of time in their hands, people who are unbelievably patient. But uh, eventually we got around to it, and um, there it is. Hockey, Heroes, and Me. I've, al I've, already, I've already got the title for the sequel. Hockey, Heroes, and Me Too. So T.W.O., ob right? Obviously, there's enough left over for a second. Oh, sure. Yeah. There's lots. I mean, this is only my 40th year of covering uh, the National Hockey League, so there are lots of stories out there that have never been told. Even you guys haven't heard them and won't. Well, I've heard some. Unless you buy the book. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so there's all kinds of stories out well, there. I've heard some, and I hope you don't mind me in, in it when I say that a few years ago when I asked you about writing a book, you said to me, mm -hmm. if I wrote what I knew, I'd, I'd have too many enemies, and I don't want to write what I know about some people. I think and what I said, I think what I said, Mitch, was, you know, if I put everything down on paper, what I know, I would embarrass uh, some people, and, you know, this sport has been so good to me over the years and to my family, I didn't really want to embarrass anybody uh, too much, um, but hey, uh, you know, time goes on. I don't think I've really embarrassed anybody. Uh, I think there's a lot of stuff in there that hasn't been mentioned before. Make enemies? Hey, I don't make enemies. Other people make enemies. I don't. There, are, there aren't that many good hockey historians around right now. And the way the game is changing these days, is that one of the goals of this book is to, is to leave in writing some pretty important stuff for, for young people to know who wouldn't know these stories. Well, I, I'm not the kind of a guy who wants to sit back and be general manager of the world. I mean, Mitch, I feel, you know, two bookends, Mitch and Mitch. Um, you know, there's nothing deadly serious in there. there there's some, hopefully, some very good and interesting stuff that, uh, that hasn't been written. There's one or two pieces in there that, that have been written, uh, starting off with the, with the Toll Blake story right, at the, right at the, off the top of the book. But, hey, there are people out there who can uh, tell a very good story. You call them historian. I mean, you know, Ken Dryden has, has written some great stuff, probably the best stuff about hockey that, that's ever been written. Until now, of course. But uh, there are a lot of people out there. We have a picture. I, I don't know. Uh, what happened to you here? I mean, you look better now. If you <laughs> I think we should point out that it's Toe Blake on the left. <laughs> what year was that? That would be in uh, after the 55-56 season. That was first of five uh, Stanley Cups that the Canadians won with with Toe Blake coaching and uh, Fisher coaching Blake. <laughs> yeah. You, would it be fair to say that you guys had a uh, tempestuous relationship? No. No. Uh, for one eight months period, I'm glad it was nine months. But for one period of eight months where we didn't speak. Uh, I wouldn't call it tempestuous or anything like that. I, I can't handle those long words, Mitch, but uh, we just didn't speak because he had blown up at me one night before a game, threatened to biff me one, as he called it, marvelous expression, and we just didn't talk for eight months. But I didn't miss a story along the way because the players knew what the situation was and they made sure that I knew exactly what was going on during all that time. I think they almost enjoyed it, the fact that Blake and I would get on the elevator and we'd be the only two people on the elevator and we'd, I'd look up at the ceiling and he'd look down at the floor and then we'd get up at the same floor and walk in opposite directions even though our rooms were in the same, right next door to one another. So that was a deep freeze then for eight months. Yeah, it was. It was and, and it was a bit uncomfortable but hey, uh, this, 
Cole Blake uh, is the greatest coach that I've ever worked with uh, in any sport. I think he was the best coach in any sport. And uh, I worked with him for 13 years, and he was a tremendous, tremendous guy uh, during those 13 years, less eight months. We were talking off the air about how difficult your beat must be, neither of us having, uh, having served that beat, especially not for as long as Piece you have. Piece of cake. I was, well, well, you know, what I was going to say was, there are a lot of people out there who probably think it's the dream job. And after doing it for so long... Yeah, well, it is a dream job. I mean, it's something I wanted to do since I was about 9 or 10 years old, and I was lucky enough to be uh, in the right place at the right time, I suppose, and, and got into the business, and uh, I've never regretted it for, for a moment. It's, it's long hours. Uh, uh, both of you know about long hours, for one reason or another. You need a great wife. Huh? You need a great wife. My wife? Gotta have a great wife. Saint. All right? You start there, and then, and then you work up. I mean, it's, uh, you have to have uh, a great partner, a wife, girlfriend, or whatever. Uh, because, you know, you, I've been away so much. Uh, during, during the hockey season, I'm, I'm away four months uh, out of the hockey season at least. And, and here you leave the family at home. That's the one very difficult part about covering any sport you know, that you're covering as a beat, whether it's baseball or, or hockey uh, or football or whatever, uh, you're away so much so you don't see the family g grow up. But if you have a partner who keeps busy, who doesn't mind that you're away for that long, uh, you know, Tilly and I have been married 48 years. She says, really, we've been married, for, you know, <laughs> past that time, for 24, probably saved our marriage. But she, she's just great about it. She, she keeps busy, and uh, she loves it when I when I go to town. Yeah, well, I can imagine she would. Oh, I mean, right well, now it's actually she's healthy. Right it's now actually she's suffering, you know, because because the season hasn't started, and hey, I might be around for a little while, and she doesn't know how to cope with that, or doesn't want to. One of the things that I really admire about newspaper people is writing to deadline. Yeah, that's, and and yeah. at the Star it wasn't as tough because it was an afternoon paper. You yep. still had a deadline, but at the Gazette, I mean, it's brutal. I guess the seven. 7.30 starts now on Saturdays. That Once helps, they do that start, helps a help, bit. But, but, you know, if the game starts at uh, 8.05, you know, you've, depending where you are, of course, but if you're in Montreal, you've got about 20 minutes to, to write a story for the first edition, and that's a little difficult, but, hey, uh, you get used to it. You know, you can handle it. How, how much is walking into the dressing room after a hockey game to get your story changed over the years? I mean, not the personalities of Toe Blake, uh, you know, Scotty Bowman or, or, or Pat Burns or whomever, but just walking into the room after it's, it seems now, and the only time I've done it is the last three or four years, yeah. it's very structured. You've got the press conference here, you move to here, you move to there, uh, talking about getting your story after yeah. the game. How I much has it changed over the I time? I don't go to press conferences. I don't believe in press conferences. I don't believe in, in, in getting as much as possible. It is sometimes you can't avoid it, but I don't believe in getting the same information and the same quotes that, that 15 or 20 other people have. I like to sit down uh, with somebody one-on-one -on -one and, and let them talk for five or ten minutes after a game and somewhere in that five or ten minutes I just know he's going to say something intelligent. I know it. And who knows, I may even ask an intelligent question during that time. That's, that's what I go for. I don't go for the, the, the interview, uh, press conference with Jacques Demers, uh, and he's saying, you know, what a great job the Canadians did. After all, they only lost 7-1. to one. I mean, who cares? I mean, the coach has to say certain things, and, you know, Demers is a master at it. Give me the one-on-one, -on -one, and that's what I want. But you're in a position, Red, where people, everybody knows who you are. You walk into yeah. the room, people know who you are. I think so. You don't have to earn anybody's respect. You're way beyond that. It's already there. How did you... What a nice thing to say, Mitch. How did you first earn the respect when you started? Because you are extremely fair. Uh, ah. Yes. ah. My favorite four-letter word. Fair. F-A-I-R, Mitch. Fair. If you're fair to the athletes, whether it's hockey player, baseball, whatever, at least... I, you know, I haven't covered, the only baseball I covered was back in AAA ball when Jackie Robinson was around, believe it or not. Uh, but if you're fair to these players, and I've spent most of my time with hockey players, they'll respect you for it, and they'll tell you a lot of things that they won't tell the pe people who haven't been fair. And, and you know, over the years, you, just, you find out that 
athletes don't mind being criticized as long as you're fair as long as you don't criticize for the sake of criticizing for the sake of perhaps getting attention that, that you know you shouldn't be getting you, you can stand on your soapbox and blast every athlete in sight and sure you'll get some attention but then you'll lose a lot of the athletes and like it or not it's a lot it's a whole lot easier and a whole lot more interesting to sit down with the athletes and have them talk to you and some of these people can talk they can really talk and, and they can bring you into areas you know where you normally wouldn't get if they didn't trust you and uh, I've tried to do that over the years it's, it's cost me a few stories over the years but uh, it's it's a very worthwhile investment one of the stories that cost me was the Wayne Gretzky story I mean We'll get into that in, in a few minutes, because right. that involves your best friend. Yeah. So here, here you are with uh, Robert Marvin Hull mm -hmm. in Moscow, a guy who was not allowed to play in 72, much to the disgust of everybody in this country, because he had signed with the World really? Hockey Association. Yeah. yeah. And then they went over as That's a group. That's on Red Square, yeah. He had just finished Apple, signing. Named, I would imagine. He had just finished. Oh, very good, Nick. <laughs> he had just finished signing. They just named it That's that he, day. That's what he tells uh, people, yeah. Uh, he had just finished signing all kinds of autographs for a bunch of the Soviet kids. One thing about Bobby, he sure knew how to sign autographs. There was my girlfriend in Moscow. <laughs> uh, now we were on the subway, and this was in his, this was through his uh, his head. And, and this wasn't in, this wasn't in '72. This was in '74 when the WHA. Well, of course, Bobby Hull was over there with WHA, and we took a subway ride. And uh, I just happened to be sitting next to that young lady, and she was not very happy at all. About having you sit next to her or having Absolutely. her picture taken. I, both, I think. Yeah. But I think mostly having me sitting next to her, because I did reach down for one of the apples she had bought. It wasn't a very good apple. You mentioned the Wayne Gretzky story, and that yeah. was a big story. And uh, like Mitch was saying, your best friend, one yeah. of your best friends is, is Glenn Sather. Yeah, he messed me up. I mean, I, I was told during the June meetings that, uh, uh, well, it's no secret, uh, Bob McCammon, who was uh, coaching Vancouver at the time, he, he said to me, uh, is it, is it true about Wayne? I said, What's, what about Wayne? He says, they're trying to deal him, meaning the Edmonton Oilers are trying to deal Wayne Gretzky. I said, oh, come on. Stop telling jokes. I said, I'm not kidding, you know. And he gave me all the details. He was offered to L.A., offered to Vancouver, 15 million U.S., 22 million Vancouver, five first-round choices, blah, blah, blah. I talked to Glenn Sather, my best friend in hockey, my best friend anyway. He's a terrific guy until that day. And... Uh, I see, what about, the, I gotta check this out. He is ridiculous. A couple of days later, I'm having breakfast with somebody, and they mention it to me. And now the June meetings are over, right? I, I'm on holidays. And I said, no, no, I talked to Sater about it, and he says, no, no. He says, check it out. So I called Sater, I said, this story won't go away. He says, ridiculous. He says, you don't believe me, call Peter. Peter is Pocklington, who owns the Evan Oilers. I call Peter Pocklington. He says, ridiculous. We get all kinds of offers, three, four offers every year for Wayne Gretzky. I said, I'm not talking about the offers that you get. I'm talking about you offering Wayne Gretzky to Los Angeles, 15 million US, five first round choices, 22 million Canadian, you know, five first round choices in Vancouver, etc. It's ridiculous, he says, we kind of like the idea of uh, being a dynasty. You know, they just won four in a row or something like that, or three in a row, whatever. Well, that was in June. I don't have to tell you what happened on August the 9th. And I was in Portugal, and I got this phone call. <laughs> you must Portugal. have felt so helpless at that point. Portugal, from the one and only, and you know this gentleman very well, Dick Urban. Did he call collect? No. <laughs> I don't think so. But he didn't call collect. And he said, don't get excited. He said, as we speak, there's a press conference convening in Edmonton. I said, Wayne Gretzky. He says, how did you know? I said, it's a long story, pal. And I slammed down the phone. And that was it. Did you feel betrayed? Yeah. But uh, and for a while. For so what was their explanation I didn't to see, you? Oh, it's, it's, it's a long it's in the explanation. Book. In the book. In the book. Uh, Sather said to me, and I confronted him with it two months later, I didn't have the heart to call him because I was a little upset, which is not quite the word I used at the time. Uh, and he said, the deal wasn't done until two, a day before it was announced. I said, what do you mean? I said, 
I've got a story in my, in my computer that I tapped out just on spec, you know, and the lead paragraph well, is... You've got to explain what spec is. Well, on speculation. You know, I was on holidays. Uh, in the event I, that it I would didn't come send to pass. It, yeah, I, no, I didn't send it down to, to the paper. I was on holidays. My best friend had told me there was nothing to it, but the lead paragraph said, is the great Gretzky about to become a king? Question mark. You know, second paragraph, uh, Edmund Euler's management uh, denies it, but blah, 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 the Gazette has learned, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I said, I've got 600 words in my computer. You want to read it? He says, did you know about Marty McSorley? Did you know about Mike Krushelnitsky, who was two players who were involved in the trade? I said a four-letter word, which wasn't fair, Mike McSorley, and the same for Krushelnitsky. Who cares about them? I'm talking about Gretzky, and I'm talking about 15 million U.S. or 22 million Canadian and the five first-round choices, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, we eventually, if you'll pardon the expression, kissed and made up, but it took a little while, and he's still my best friend. How do you, how do you make that decision not to run that story that the Gazette has learned, although it's denied by the Edmonton Oilers and everybody else? I think the biggest reason I made that decision wa was that I was on holidays. And, and really, I don't like writing speculative stories you can't or rumors up. Yeah, that you can't really follow. I don't like those at all. I know a lot of people do, but I don't like to do it. But in, in that case, you know, looking back on it, I suppose I should have. Let me, let me ask you about it. We just saw something briefly up there. We're going to get yeah. it back again in a second uh, about uh, a painting that Glenn Sather promised you. Oh, that, that's such a long story. It's right there. In the book. It's okay, such well, a long we're going to we're going to cut right hours. to the punchline because we have a story here. He promised you an Indian painting. You're very much into Indian art, right? Mm -hmm. And eventually, after took how three many years, attempts, took three years. Three there, years. He, there he is with Jim Nielsen, former That's NHL right. defenseman, presenting you with a picture of Nielsen, an who Indian. was a full-blooded Indian painting his house. <laughs> and Sater said, "I mean, what could be more genuine than that? Jim Nielsen, an Indian painting his house. There's your Indian painting. <laughs> there it is." I mean, it's it's <laughs> at my home, you know, a place of honor. Uh, look at look at me. I'm dying there on the screen. <laughs> the tears are streaming down my face. That's and I'm an example, wearing an old jacket. That's a glimpse into the uh, yeah. Sather sense of humor. Isn't yeah, it? He, he's a marvelous. He's a marvelous guy. He is the smartest man in hockey, and uh, he's a terrific guy. Except for that Gretzky thing. Did you know that Sather was going to make it when Sather was a player? No question. No question. I mean, you knew he had the, you he the had, wherewithal? Well, I, I knew he was going to make it as a coach and beyond that as a general manager. I mean, he had no talent as a player. He had heart, all kinds of heart. He played for six different teams in the nine years he spent in the NHL. But, oh, as, as he got it up here, I mean, in Banff, Alberta, where he's had a home for about 25 or 30 years, you're, you need special permission from, from the Banff Park people to build a home. You, you can only build it a certain way, and you're only allowed to build one. You know, Glenn Sater at one time owned 13 homes in Banff. Well, you're only allowed one. You gotta admire a guy like that. <laughs> Absolutely. Which yeah. cup is this one? That one? And who's the gentleman in the middle? Well, that's, uh, he's in the book too. That's Johnny Golka, who's a, a friend of uh, Sather's, and uh, that's we went goose hunting, Sather and I. I had never fired a rifle or a shotgun in my life. We went goose hunting at Galka's place, and I was after, I don't know, Grey Cup number four. I, I'm not sure. Stanley Cup. You must have been no. in your heavy face because he only fits halfway in the, uh, <laughs> in the picture. Well, yeah, I was 30 pounds heavier. I've lost 30 pounds this, this we got, What this is this summer. ring that you're this wearing ring? here? Yes. We have had. Well, that's a special Stanley Cup ring, I guess. Very expensive. Just hold it like that. Very ex actually, I'll tell you, players did not get rings until about the mid-60s, all right? Now, which means that the players on the teams, the Canadian teams that won five consecutive cups during the 50s had nothing really to show for it. Now, when Ronald Corey, the current president of the Montreal Canadiens, took over somewhere in 82 or 83, he threw a party for the 12 players who were on the five consecutive, you know, five consecutive Stanley okay. Cup teams, and he gave all of them, those dozen players, this ring, all right? 
And he also gave rings to the th three or four, four media people who covered the team during that time. And I felt quite all right accepting it because uh, this was a different situation. So I got one. Jacques Beauchamp, who covered the team, got one. Danny Gallivan got one. And uh, Rene LeCavalier got one. Well, there's a big difference that Mitch was talking about at the beginning compared to now. You, you say five people, four or five regulars covering the Canadians oh, when yeah, you started, sure. and now it's what, well, 15? 15, 20. During the playoffs, you know, if you count all the technicians and so on, you, you'll have 30 people on a, on a road trip. What do you think when you see 50, 60 people at a hockey practice? I say, hey, nice to see you guys. <laughs> a I, hockey practice, 50, 60 people covering yeah, a hockey practice. Yeah, but, but look, look it's, it, it, it's a big deal in Montreal. I don't have to tell you that. Uh, you'll, you'll see the same number in Quebec City, maybe even more, because, you know, it's, it's the only game in town, certainly uh, between uh, October or September and, and hopefully May. Hasn't gone that long lately, but uh, the interest is there, so, you, so you, you do it. I don't know what kind of prognosticator you are, but having you here so you what may kind as well, of a question is that you may as well you know, a great one yeah. yeah you may as well prognosticate on, on on when you think this whole mess is going to end and when we might see some hockey well like all prognosticators it's the gut feeling that does it for you my gut feeling is somewhere mid-december maybe shortly before christmas at the earliest mm. i think you know which is a shame i'd i'd like i'd love to see it start tomorrow because uh, we're all missing something but hey the owners and the players have to settle things and I can tell the players, you know, right now that uh, the owners, uh, if you think the players are together, those owners are 100% together and they're not going to back off. I got to tell you that. And that's why it, it's going to go for a good long time. I mean, I think the players underestimated the resolve of the, of the owners. They thought they'd back off very quickly. They're not going to do it. Not with Bettman around, because he's a tough bird and he's got the owners and he's got the bylaws to back him up. And it's going to be a long time coming i'm sad to say and uh, that's too bad for everybody but hey life goes on well it, you've got you're not going to miss any hockey games on this book tour that's what i said he didn't I like that not. comment <laughs> but he'd rather be covering the hockey games i guess well, sure I, i'd rather be covering off. the hockey games there i'd is, work in the book tour there is as the title suggests there is more than hockey in this book and yeah, we're, taking, we're taking a look at one of the pages of photographs here that involved well there's the sugar ray robinson yeah. on the upper left Ta talk about eddie quinn who you were very good friends with, and I know you were there when he died. The most unforgettable character in sports I have ever met, including the two Mitches, <laughs> Glenn Sather, and so on. The most unforgettable guy. I mean, here, here was a guy wrestling a boxing promoter in Montreal. Uh, around in the early 50s, I didn't meet him until the mid 50s. He was earning about $350,000 a year, which, you know, was kind of big money in those days. It's big money these days, not big enough for you guys, but hey, this guy would earn 350 and spend 360. He was unbelievable and the most lovable guy I've ever met on top of everything else. I mean, if you had him as a friend, like Sather, you always have a friend. Archie Moore? Archie Moore, yeah, he was up for one of the fights, ran out in one of the fights too. He was supposed to, to fight, uh, I believe it was Robert Clarou. It was Robert Clarou. And uh, he was arguing about money, too, right up until the day of the fight, and he didn't like it, and he just... I was coming in from Toronto after having covered a fight, a Floyd Patterson's fight in Toronto against uh, Tom McNeely the night before, and I, I flew into Montreal, and there's Archie at the, uh, at the airport, and he's leaving town. I said, where are you going, Arch? Haven't you got a, a boat tonight? He says, yeah, well, Eddie, Eddie backed off on the money uh, he promised me, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and I said, hey, you're going to kill this guy. He says, tough. Got on the plane and left. That was it. Your face doesn't light up that often, but I've seen it light up when you talk about being a grandfather. And that's been something that you've tried to spend more time being yeah. in the last little while. Well, I think uh, at, at some point during this postponement lockout, I'm heading down to New York to see uh, my grandson, Ryan, who will be two on November 5, and is probably the best-looking two-year-old I've ever seen. Well, Here's a great shot, Mitch. Take a look at this. This well, is from now you can see where his looks come from, right? <laughs> huh? This is uh, look at his mother, uh, uh, his grandmother on the right. That is 1948, correct? Well, uh, the, that is uh, our honeymoon. Is that the year I was married? 46 sure, years ago. No, no, I've been married 48 years. So that would be 46. Yeah. And where is that? Where was your honeymoon? 
Geez, I don't mean to stump you. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the honeymoon was in Atlantic City. I'm trying to remember the honeymoon. I was just going to say, it looks like the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Yeah. That didn't exist in 1946. What a great looking couple. I think so. Yeah. Certainly the, the, and there the we lady go. on the right. Wow, this is the night you were inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, yeah. And that's. Is that, that's your greatest hockey, is that your greatest hockey moment? moment? It was one of them. It was one of them. Uh, there are a lot of great hockey moments. Well, that's a personal great hockey moment. All yeah. the others have been, you know, yeah, it was nice. not related to you directly. It was very nice. I was uh, quite proud of it. It was a, it was a, good, a real good night. Well, I'll tell you, when, when, uh, when I marry close to 50 years, I hope I look as good as uh, those two people we just saw up there. That's, Isn't uh, that nice of you to say so? That's, uh, that was nice. That's yeah. nice. We're getting too touching here now. Really? Yeah. Well, uh, why not? Yeah, there's, there's more than just hockey. I mean, your greatest hockey moment has to be, obviously, one of them has to always be getting inducted into the Hockey Hall of Fame. Now you've written a book. In the last minute, what more does Red Fisher really want to accomplish as a, as a hockey writer? There's not much more you can do. You're in the Hall of Fame. How many Stanley Cups have you seen? All of them, almost? I've, no, I've, uh, I've watched the Canadians win 17 of their 24. Right. Now you wrote a book. Yeah. What else is left? Uh, I want to be a broadcaster. <laughs> <laughs> you've done it. Got a shot. <laughs> you've done it. <laughs> So is there is there going to be another book? Is there definitely going to be? Oh, I, it's far too soon to tell. Yeah. You keep I all notes. You keep notes your whole career. You have notes. You've remembered all these stories. Up here. That's incredible. That's a talent. I guess writers have that talent or good ones. I do. don't think it's incredible. Hey, well, people I think you remember, remember fifty years worth of stories. That's pretty good. Yeah. It's in here. A lot of them are in here. Hockey Heroes and Me, by our guest Red Fisher, and it's a terrific book. It's funny. There's a lot of funny moments. Yeah, in there I hope too. so. Yeah. And it's Thank now you, available in all bookstores near you. Twenty six ninety nine. <laughs> well, worth buy it. one? And they can even see you signing it some places, I guess. Yeah, sure. Be worth a lot of money one I'll day. probably have a few hockey players with me, too. As Matthew Schneider said the other day, it's the only thing I'll sign this year. <laughs> All right, well, Red Fisher will only be back the next time that Red Fisher writes a book. That's what it took to get him here, and that's what it'll take to get him back. So until next time, for Mitch Melnick and Red Fisher, I'm Mitch Garber. Thanks for watching the Sports Hot Seat. We'll see you next week. Sports Hot Seat is brought to you in part by Sport Buff in Plaza Alexis Neon, where you'll find the entire line of starter sportswear.